system that's in place that is going to um, you know, work with um, for, so that we can get reimbursements back from FNS. Um, so I think it, it is a unique partnership, but the most important thing is, is we're not asking you to do anything different than you really, that already aligns with an allowable activity um, for, for FANT or SNAP ENT. Um, but it's, and I think there's, as we grow, there's different ways that we can look at um, how, how we align. Um, and, and how the community colleges fit in with it. Um, but yeah, I just I think it's a great opportunity uh, for this unique partnership, you know, so I'm excited about it. And it looks like, Kate, you were able to come back in and get the uh, hosting capabilities. So that, that's a, a plus there as well. Um, there was just one last piece and, and apologies if Don did talk about it. And when I talk about the different configurations, so we talked last time a little bit that community colleges are unique in, in their language and compared to workforce. So a community college is gonna to talk to a community college and they're gonna understand what they're saying, right? So the dialects there, they all understand. And so I can see us down the road um, having a lead community college to be an intermediary. And you guys have learned about what an intermediary is still may funnel through a Michigan Works Agency because it works that way best, may not, that would be a little, that'd be a harder stretch to do, but I can see where there would be benefits to the state if we had a lead community college um, that understood the process and helped the other community colleges and took some of the burden off of them, especially we have, you know, five community colleges in the room now, but there are 19 of them, my information is correct. So to be able to expand it down the road would be great if, um, you know, we had a lead community college that helped tell that story and help bring on other colleges. So that's something down the road to think about how this partnership's unique as well. So hopefully that was all your clarifying things, Kate. Yeah. And Steve, go ahead. Sure. Um, I just actually had a question. Uh, related to the intermediary model. Lisa, do you know, or actually this might go to Precious, do you know if the, the Community College Association would be interested in taking the lead as an intermediary or would you prefer, are you thinking more an individual college take the lead as an intermediary? Um, I would have to take that back to our leadership to get you a final answer. I don't feel comfortable giving one today. Um, I know look, whether that's a community college or an MCCA um, or whether that's us as an organization, I think that's very uh, big picture. Um, mm -hmm. We are focused on or, or hoping to look at what community colleges can do right now to kind of get our feet wet, um, seeing as this is a new space for a lot of our colleges as well as, as um, our, us at MCCA. So I hope that kind of answers your question. It, it does. And just so I'm, I'm not sure if you're aware, we do have a new opportunity. We received a new partnership grant, which, mm -hmm. and one of our focuses is state systems or associations. Okay. So as an intermediary model, just in case uh, you might be interested. So. Okay. Well, thanks for sharing, Steve. I'll, sure. I'll share that with our leadership. Okay. Okay, any other questions about any of that or clarifying before we jump into the agenda? Okay, so I think the um, the next piece we wanted to talk about is really how to identify potential participants or um, for ENT and really wanted to speak to the opportunity of this. I think one of the things um, that I found or heard from a lot of partners, I heard it when I led the work in Oregon, is that it's it can be daunting if it's seen as like yet another initiative or yet another thing to do on top of everything else. And so really in thinking about how to identify participants for the program to really integrate and braid this into the work that you're already doing. And so um, I think with that, it's thinking about how to... Um, to identify where you're doing basic needs and security work already with the college, where you're already doing workforce work, 
where what services you're providing already and then also where are those touch points for outreach how are you working with your community-based organizations how are you working with your head start where are those touch points already and so in thinking about that just i think that's a great way to frame it is that those individuals those students you're serving those connection points FAET plus the plus program can actually be an enhanced service that really kind of connects all those things together. So it's not outside of you don't need new money, you don't need new programs, you don't need you need to enhance something, but it's really a way to build it off. So I guess to start off the conversation, um, we would really like to hear from any of the college partners um, in, and also our, our national partners too of what you've seen. Um, work of how, what what information do community colleges collect right now? So are there points where you know if someone's on SNAP, if you know someone's on cash assistance, if you know they have a lower income um, and aren't receiving benefits, but might be receiving Pell, for instance? Um, so if you, we'd like to open that up if you want to use the hand raise function, um, and also would love to see ideas in the chat, um, just as a kind of a starting place to get us going. Rachel. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I would just want to say we do not have anything on lockdown here. We are trying to like fumble through this in the best way possible. So one of the opportunities that presented itself truly, I mean, this was not an initiative we looked for. It was just sort of an intersection that made sense. So we received Perkins funding and the state provides a list as students are working with Michigan work agencies and have identified Macomb as a potential um, partner that they would like to explore some continuing education with. So this, our Perkins um, director forwards that information to us and then we do outreach to these folks who are on this list. They may or may not be coming to Macomb but they've identified Macomb as a potential partner. So um, because they're already working with Michigan Works, we sort of have this kind of dance that we're doing. Um, we're at about a 50-50 of students who have actually identified Macomb and who've applied. And so we're doing a little bit of outreach that way. We have a whole um, student options for success program that works with students who um, have a series of vulnerabilities. Um, and we work with Pell information or students who are receiving Pell in that capacity, but it doesn't always the dotted line, not a straight line to other benefits that they may be receiving. But the most direct way is right now through the Perkins information that we're getting um, from our director. That's a really innovative use of Perkins funds and a cool way to kind of um, identify and do intentional outreach for folks who could get more um, but more services. And that exactly is a great spot and the kind of thing where you could look at how could you add in plus as a service there too. And it's clumsy. So I just want to, I, there's nothing yeah. shiny about this. It is clumsy at best. Yeah. Other ideas? Kate, I can share some ways okay, that I've heard colleges um, talk be great. about how they go about student needs. So um, at many of our community colleges now, there's something called a student concern form. If a student is expressing any type of need to their faculty member or another care person on, on their campus, a student concern form can be submitted. And that can be anything from shortcomings with transportation, um, concerns with childcare, um, most often it's a food insecurity that student would communicate what barrier they're experiencing and that concern form would then go to an individual or a department that would partner with the student to explore more, ask more questions, be curators, and then make sure that those barriers are being addressed by um, with that student in partnership with that student. 
Um, so that's one strategy that community colleges are using. Another one that um, is has lots of potential that I see is partnership with financial aid. So some institutions have specific partnerships with financial aid because once a student submits their FAFSA information, there are several indicators that would let an institution know that this student is, um, could potentially have some trouble financially with enrollment or staying enrolled. Um, we call that a zero EFC, estimated family contribution. So if a student has a, a low or zero family estimated contribution, the institution or financial aid can hand off that student to the student services department that would work with the student to set up a financial package, explore other financial options to make sure that that student has the services um, and the support that they need to enroll and stay enrolled. Another scenario, if a financial aid office um, doesn't feel comfortable sharing that information with other individuals at their institution, financial aid could be that point of contact for that student that says, hey, there are other resources that you could take a hold of. For example, SNAP, the public state benefits um, food assistance program. So um, financial aid is another way. Um, the last one I'll share are intake forms. So um, there's several community colleges who have an intake form where once a student enrolls at the institution, there's a form that the student can complete, which is just a questionnaire that allows for the institution to identify any potential barriers that the student might experience upon enrolling um, and attending their institution. And those barriers can be addressed prior to enrollment. There are other institutions who don't just administer this intake form upon entry to the, to the college, but um, also the second term, because as we know, students' needs are gonna vary from semester to semester. So to make sure that no student need is um, going without or uh, being unmet, the intake form is administered throughout the semester. Um, uh, I think those are the, the top three ways that institutions are, are aware of basic needs. And I think if we shift that focus from identifying student needs to, okay, now that we know what those student needs are, how can we connect them to SNAP? And then how can we connect them to SNAP ENT? So that could look like an intake form that has a pointed question that says, Do, are you currently receiving SNAP food assistance? That's something that could be added to the intake form that's already in play. Another thing you could do is have appointed meetings with financial aid. Um, and in those meetings, you could have um, some language that financial aid sends to students who have a zero or low EFC after they complete their FAFSA that says, if you have a, a low or zero EFC, there are other community resources available to you, and that could be food assistance. Please contact our office at financial aid or um, the student services office to learn more information. Um, Gail, I see your hand raised. Perhaps I might be able to provide an answer. No, I was just going to uh, piggyback on what you said. We have uh, for on campus, um, our credit students, we have uh, the Family Life Center that is where students go for basic needs and they do fill out a form. So that information is tracked. And so then one, from, mm -hmm. from, sorry, from the basic needs, then they will meet with the, with the um, social worker. And then uh, whatever that basic need is, it, it will be addressed. And um, oftentimes that is food insecurity. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for sharing that, Gail. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for that. And thank you, Precious, for a good overview of what the colleges are doing and would also lift up those are all critical success factors that I've seen work in other states that I saw work um, in Oregon as well. And I think a couple other um, opportunities for that too is one of the things I've done is worked with a foundation at the college to add the question onto the um, any of the scholarship applications if they are receiving SNAP or have experienced housing, food, basic needs, and security. That was a screening point that um, enrolled a number of, of students there. And then you can leverage the money and be reimbursed for any of the scholarship funding that's coming in that way. So that's one point. Um, 
I think those intake scholarships are really great and, um, or in, intake forms rather, um, and just having that as part of the enrollment and onboarding process so that it also reduces a stigma. I think it's really important to try to normalize that off the out of the gate. Um, one of the things heard from students really consistently is that the sense that um, they didn't want to apply for benefits because they thought it was taking away resources from someone who might need it more. So really having that um, that information out of the front that there's plenty of resources for everyone that just as Pell helps pay for their tuition, SNAP can help cover the cost of food and ENT plus can support them so they can complete their goals and contribute to their community. That was a message that was really important, especially for returning and adult students um, and addressing any of the racism and sexism that are frequently incorporated into the, the pushback against public benefits. Um, and one of the ways that um, there've been some studies that have been shown to be really effective to do that is to almost create a script for staff and faculty um, and just some talking points around how to do that. That was that came up in a lot of conversations I've seen happen that they want, that faculty and staff want to make those referrals to resources, but don't know how to bring up the conversation and don't want to give the wrong information. So just providing folks with the tools and that can be for faculty to put it on their syllabus um, that they have a statement at the bottom around basic needs and security and resources around that. Um, it can be for advisors, for financial aid, for any of the onboarding, for info desk folks. If you have those anywhere, that actually is one of the central points where a lot of times students get directed to resources or not, your adult education programs. Um, and then also just really student-centered flyers um, that are really simple and get at, you know, what's, what's in it for the student to look into the program. Um, so those are some additional ways to, to consider, um, and, and also just incorporating any of the intake information to any other forms that you already have out there, right? So instead of creating yet another, if you already have something, you can start incorporating some of that FANT plus. Um, so want to give also space for Steve or any of our other partners to speak to some of the, the things too there. I had a, a question or a, a comment, um, and this might be directed to Don and, and folks at DHHS. Um, is there a role that SNAP outreach providers can play? Um, and uh, are they doing anything on campus uh, currently or just, um, I, I would be curious to know if, if that's an opportunity as well um, for uh, colleges to engage with uh, the SNAP outreach providers who, whose role really is to um, connect people to SNAP in the community and if there's something they can be doing to kind of bridge that gap. And one of the things I do know that I hear, um, well, one, one thing is students don't always know they're eligible and it's student eligibility is complicated um, at best, <laughs> I think, to understand. And so, um, you know, folks who are well versed in understanding eligibility and who can help have those conversations or even just help educate college staff on those things can be really valuable. Um, and we talk about that a lot, uh, even, you know, outside of the college conversation, but just in general, like connecting with your SNAP outreach providers can be really helpful. I apologize that Grand Rapids Community College couldn't be here today. They're currently participating in another conference, but I can speak for them that they do have a DHS person who is stationed on their campus. So there is opportunity to be able to leverage that um, DHH, DHHS person um, in connecting students with FAENT. And some of the other colleges um, and states we're working with, they're utilizing their SNAP outreach workers that um, are located on campus to get more students connected to SNAP um, and really integrating it into their food pantry um, efforts too. And then they're going to include information about um, SNAP ENT. Um, in one state, um, uh, the state is also, they have access to like the heat maps of where there's more residents who are receiving SNAP and they're going to, they're sending out targeted postcards um, about the college programs and things that way. So they're using their, their SNAP outreach tools that way to actually do outreach for the college. It looks like it's a college 
um, postcard or a provider postcard, but it talks about the program and, it, and it's outreach that way. And they're using that as part of their outreach grant. So that's a really good, um, thanks for lifting that up, Susan, because that is another really good strategy of how to work with those partners and they might be community-based organizations. They might be on campus, but really being intentional about that. I have a question. So Kate or perhaps Susan, is there sample language that you guys could share with some of the community colleges that could be put in an email or a postcard or something like that? I'm sure I can find some some stuff. I'll work I'll work on that and I'll I'll send it your way cuz I know I've I've come across flyers that colleges have used and and languages or languages thing uh wording and 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 stuff that can be incorporated. That would be so helpful. Thank you. Yeah, and we have, um, I think, like a program folder with some of that in there. So I'll resend and I'll share it with this group because I'm not sure it's shared with all the same folks. So I'll add that um, for sure. Okay, could I um, just add a quick comment? And it's back to something you mentioned about, it, you know, existing forms and, and utilizing them or enhancing them. And I would just add if there's specific programs that have their own unique onboarding orientation admissions form. Um, those can be leveraged as well. And a specific example we did in Oregon was for certain programs like adult education, ESOL, GED that have their own um, sort of unique process because of the populations they're serving, if it's non-native English speakers or folks coming in a different door of the college. I, I know some colleges were able to adapt that process and include questions about basic needs and security as a means of identifying potential students as well. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, that's a like a really great example. Another point of, of a helpful strategy. So we will follow up with and share the resources around this and different examples of flyers or websites or um, different framing, even and kind of talking points of use to do this um, or and um, both in terms of um, the ass assessment form and then flyers. So I'll send that out with the truncated recording um, when this is done so you all have access to that. So I think now that we are thinking about the program and so determining the eligibility and access, um, really want to think about now that we identify students who can benefit, individuals who can become students and benefit, really how to get them connected to support services. And I think this is the piece for colleges that I just want to underscore and all partners really is that this is to me was the amazing part of FANT is it was the flexibility to or in ENT in general, but the flexibility to provide support services that really threaded together and met students where they're at and what they needed. And a lot of times it made the difference whether they enrolled or completed the their credential. We've heard that consistently over time from students, saw that in qualitative that they were on the verge of dropping out. And frequently it's right when they're close to getting their credential um, or that they just didn't, wouldn't have enrolled without it. So I think that's the, the piece here um, that's really great. And also many colleges have started providing support services. It's just really challenging to fund consistently. So I guess wanted to open it up to you about what support services are available at the colleges currently. Um, and also in that, like, what would you like to be able to offer, but aren't for students? And, and again, want to open that up to Precious or National Partners um, for any other trends you're seeing there. wanted to give an opportunity for um, any community colleges to share. So please let me know if I am missing um, or missing anything or left anything out. Um, currently community colleges uh, are offering advising, um, holistic advising. So when a student comes into their campus, they are identified with an advisor or assigned an advisor um, to make sure that they not only enroll, but stay enrolled um, and get into their program or career of, um, of desire. Um, there's also uh, emergency grants. So if a student has an eminent, uh, an acute need, 
um, for clothing for a job interview or something like that. Um, there's uh, funding available for that. Um, some institutions also have mental health supports. I know that's not necessarily a covered support um, underneath SNAP ENT, but this is my advocacy effort to um, have someone on this call consider mental health as a supportive service. Um, there's also um, community colleges, or um, I believe Gail had mentioned this in her one-stop shop model that students can come and get food from their food pantry, clothing from their clothing closet, connect with a social worker. They also have mental health counseling within this one-stop model. Um, so, and, and the food pantries are really expansive, so it's not just um, food, there's non-perishables. Some community colleges are even offering microwaves and pots and pans. Um, it's not enough to just have a can good on campus if you don't have a can opener for it. Um, they also have diapers and, and things like that. So community colleges are really doing um, what was considered impossible um, at one point. Um, please let me know what I missed because I know I missed something. Oh, and career advising. I'm sorry. Um, there's also career advising and resume support once a student is um, approaching graduation or looking to transfer. So, Precious, I could chime in real quick because I have the refer. I have the form pulled up, and it is career, child care, clothing, counseling, financial aid, budgeting information, food, housing, legal, medical, mental health, emergency fund, transportation utility and other. <laughs> so yes, you're right. It's absolutely just like a one stop. And I will say this also for our on our non credit side, our intake forms capture the same information. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times it's if the community college doesn't have that particular support available, they're connecting with a community organization that does. What we want is to encourage community colleges to be experts in their area and for community based organizations to be experts in their own right. It's oftentimes about that that key um, partnership with the community organization if that service is not available on campus at that time. I think the last service that um, I forgot to mention was health. Um, there's one institution up north who has a partnership with their uh, health organization in their community. And so sometimes they'll send students over there who have health concerns or needs. And Precious, I will also share this. So we have experts in those fields that have office hours at the financial, I mean, at our Family Life Center. So they are experts in the area. And then they are they uh, the students are referred to them during that appointment time that they are there. Yeah. That's a really phenomenal model at Mott um, and one would like to lift up for others to consider. And to me, that's like the perfect point to integrate kind of access to to would to consider integrating access to plus. Um, especially because there's, um, it's so rare that the same information is offered on the non-credit side. That's just unheard of. Like, it's like, you know, colleges are generally starting to create more robust services uh, um, and awareness of how much basic needs and security is impacting enrollment and completion. But then the funding model is tricky. And so frequently it's not for, I think, lack of interest, but it just is rarely offered on the non-credit side. Um, and so that's really amazing. And that to me is what I've seen as the most robust um, ENT programs are those that serve students holistically on the continuum to get in to get a credential and get into a career that offers economic mobility. So whether they're starting in adult ed or a non-credit training program that leads to a credential, or they're doing up to a CTE associate's degree, depending on what they need to really get out of poverty sustainably and, and support um, their goals. And so I think that's thinking about how to build that out. And what I found is ENT was a really great way to kind of connect those things and build those services to meet the needs of students. It's a really impressive list. Um, anything else, Steve, Susan, anyone else want to share, Mark, around this piece? I would just uh, reemphasize those partnerships with community-based organizations um, and thinking about, you know, you don't have to do everything, um, really connecting people to those supports that are out there, those partnerships that you may already have. And then for the MWAs in the audience, 
to think about that when you're looking at college partnerships, also look at the community-based organizations that could really be offering sort of <clears throat> some services and activities that complement what's happening on college. And you can all do it with SNAP e &T and and all get reimbursed through SNAP e &T. Um, and it's a great model and often, um, you know, really what what's best for for the participant. And again, it it helps you think about it in, in a way that doesn't make you think that you have to do everything to meet that participant's needs. Thanks, Susan. Yeah, it really is like it, it's a, it connects partnerships, right? And it allows everyone to to really serve the person really effectively and leverage the resources and expertise each organization or institution has. And so I think that's what I really saw. It shifted some of the partnerships um, in really profound ways in Oregon and in some um, and I see that happening in other states as well. And I think working with partners like Head Start that, you know, maybe weren't as in that could provide childcare that maybe weren't as embedded in the college in other um, regions have seen that it's their employment department and their WIB and their county housing. And they have this whole system set up where they meet as a team and plan how to do that. Um, and in doing that, they're just getting much better outcomes for their participants. Um, so really a, a great opportunity. And I think the support services sometimes can also be the hook to get um, what I've seen participants connected to the coaching or that holistic support too, that oftentimes in the end, that's what people will point to made the difference for them. So just also want to lift up that that's a, the support services are crit critical to the success, but it's also something that that tended to draw students in immediately because they have an emergent need, they need it addressed, they'll get connected and then they realize there's all this other support that they had no idea could benefit them to that degree. So I think that's the other piece. Um, and so with that, I think Lisa, did you wanna, sh is this the time you wanna share a little bit more about what's allowable um, in yeah. support services? Okay, so I'll pull up the PowerPoint here. Perfect. And um, I, I think my internet connection um, is not the best, so I'm going to keep my camera off because last time I guess I was kind of going in and out. So, <clears throat> so yeah, so really what I want to take a step back and just think about supportive services in, in the role of FANT plus, right? So SNAP me and T, it's a requirement. And so as a community college coming into this program, they're coming into when they they have a student that's eligible and they want to put them into plus they are putting the customer into a snap ENT activity which here on the screen you'll see supportive services are a required element of our FANT program because it's a requirement um, from the of the funding so we need to make sure that if we DHHS determines that a student is eligible and a good fit for FANT, that at the state, um, we have to make sure that we are offering and trying to assist them with overcoming a barrier that might prevent them from engaging in that activity. So if this is getting to a physical class location, if that's what it is, um, we have, a you know, can help with transportation. If it's, um, a virtual situation and um, they they need a laptop for the period of time for um, the training um, we have that's an allowable supportive services but i i really just want to make sure that everybody understands when we choose to ask dhhs for eligibility for a student we also take on that role um, as a state that we will make sure that we can assist them with overcoming their barrier to participate. It doesn't mean we have to eliminate everything. We, you know, there's, um, the state may have limitations on what they can do, but we just want to make sure that we're, and that's one of the reasons why we assess our students, our, our participants to make sure that we understand where they might have some barriers. There are two forms of supportive services. Um, and that's just in what's available. So if you happen to be a 
a college that has workforce um, department and you go ahead and once the customer has finished their training or close to it, you're working with them with resume assistance and um, they get a job. If you happen to like track that and you, you know, at the end and you support them for, you know, a length of time, um, there's also job retention supportive services. It's a subset um, of services that can be provided to that student while they're first employed um, up to 90 days. So I just point them out that those are the two. And we can go ahead and move on. These are not all of the allowable supportive services. Um, you can go to our manual um, in chapter two and you can see them all. I highlighted what I thought would be things that you know, might be um, applicable to the student population. Um, and the ones with an asterisk are the ones that would be available if you were tracking and offering job retention services for your newly employed students. So um, obviously clothing is just the first one. Um, if they needed a uniform for their new position, that would be something that could you know, be covered under job retention if that was an, something that you were offering. So these are just basic, um, and you know, the licensing, all right, I'm gonna step back. Some of the stuff I do want you to see can be a, a direct reimbursement to the customer, to your student. Some stuff you're gonna see like test fees, maybe that's built in into a tuition base, maybe that's built into the class, okay? So um, this is for all of ENT. So you may not be offering this as a reimbursement, as a supportive service, okay? But another organization may. So when you look at this, um, understand it may be part of your program tuition, your, your model that way. Um, you can go ahead to the next slide. So, you know, what if that transportation barrier was um, that there wasn't a bus system and they, um, you know, needed to finish to get their driver's training. I mean, they do this at the workforce centers. Um, maybe it was, um, you know, they couldn't pay the, the uh, license renewal fee, right? Not any fines or anything like that, but just the standard, I can't renew my driver's license because I don't have the $10, right? Um, obviously due to COVID, we brought in technology equipment. That was a great um, enhancement to the participant reimbursements. Um, I do point out here um, where we have the um, like the internet or hotspots limited to three months. That is a state um, limit. Um, however, it's longer if it's associated with a training program. So I just wanted to point that out that if they're in a 12 week training program, just make sure that, you know, that could be something that's offered longer than and though that's three months. So, OK, let's do it a little bit longer. <laughs> A four month one. Um, again, here's your uh, training materials. Maybe those are built in, but textbooks. Um, of course, we still use, um, if they're, you know, this is when something, another funding source didn't cover it and, or it's with non federal, but these are some of the ideas of what I thought might you'd look at to see um, what you could provide as a participant reimbursement. Um, I don't know at the community college setting how much of it would be used um, outside of transportation and some training materials. Um, but one thing I want to point out and um, about the, the amount of funding. So we have different rules and this is a little bit into the weeds, but we have different rules for a, a plus provider. So as a college, um, so if it's a a, a customer at a Michigan Work Service Center just going through FANT, we have, due to funding, we have a limited amount of that can be spent on supportive services. As a plus provider, we don't have that limit. It, again, it's reasonable and necessary to participate in the activity. So if you're reading through the manual and you see this $960 um, a participant, it's because it's a funding issue at the um, at the state level for our regular FAT program. Um, here, we just look at reasonable and necessary. I think you can move ahead. Okay, so again, just as an overview, you know, we're 
The goal is to help that customer overcome their barriers so that they can get to the college and participate in that training program, you know, and we want to make sure. So that means we need to identify it. So in your intake process, and you need to identify what their potential barriers are so that you can go ahead and see if there's the funding and the resource to do this. Um, the customer does need to be, the student needs to be active, you know, so this is at a point that they're active in in um, FANT plus, not just active at the college in their programming. They're actually um, in FANT plus. And so I'm, I'm gonna go in the weeds here, but I just want you to understand that to be active in FANT plus means you're working with your local Michigan Works Agency. That, you know, this is down the road, you've got your contract, you're working with your Michigan Works Agency, and we you are part of Leo W online case management system and you're entering data into OSMIS. Um, so I don't want um, I don't want to turn anybody off that oh this is another process this is what we have to do but every state does have some type of case management process. Um, so I know some of you are familiar with it because you've been involved with the Michigan Works Agency. So if you're when you're providing supportive services we it's important that you have case file documentation that explains why that supportive service was needed. You've done your intake, you understand what your barriers are, and, it, and we also document what the supportive service was that you provided. And we do, I'm just being upfront, this is all done in our OSMA system. Um, and then it covers us for when um, FNS is looking into our system to say, okay, why was this provided and what it was, it's all in one spot. It may also be in your own systems, but this is what one of the pieces that we do have to bring over into ASMIS is the supportive services. Um, I don't think there's, okay, yes. Okay, so I want to talk one, just a couple more minutes about how this can look. So it sounded like, you know, I think it was Gail that, you know, has the list of things that the colleges offer, and that's awesome. Maybe you're not in that situation. Maybe you don't have the funding for it. Maybe, you know, for whatever reason, you don't have um, funding to pay for a bus pass or mileage reimbursement. We're just going to keep it simple. You, that's the partnership, the partnership with the Michigan Works Agency. That's where that becomes so important. Because every student that is put into FANT Plus is also a part of the Michigan Works Agency. So that is a student that the Michigan Works Agency can support. Um, and so the Michigan Works Agency has funding specifically for FANT customers, which every Plus customer is an FANT customer. And they have funding specific for supportive services. So um, it's while it's necessary that we provide the student with the, the supportive service to get them engaged in, in the activity, it doesn't have to come from the college. It can come from the Michigan Works Agency. Um, we're working right now, West Michigan Works, um, who would be the agency, of course, for um, Grand Rapids Community College and Muskegon Community College. They are partnering with one of their plus providers to help with transportation assistance for their plus provider. So it's it's such a great partnership that um, both entities can support that student. As long as we're not paying for the same thing, providing the same service, the student can get support from the Michigan Works Agency through their regular FANT grant and from um, um, the community college for the, you know, the potential plus provider. I think that's really what I had for you, Kate. Okay, thank you. Um, and I think the other um, piece really there too is there's that opportunity to partnership and, and align who's paying for what in really powerful ways. And then if no organization or agency has funding for something, we'll dive into it more, but that's what's amazing about the reimbursement is the reimbursement becomes unrestricted funding that then you can put back into funding that support service that you need. So that's 
that's, I think, another thing we'll get into the details about, but this really can provide a robust funding stream that allows you to pay for and fund those support services that aren't available, but that use that are aren't available currently at a college or through your Michigan Works Agency, but that you're seeing are really critical as long as they're allowable within um, the FAT Plus program. And that list is pretty robust of what's available. So I think that's the other thing to think about too, is that flexibility is pretty amazing and being able to meet the needs of students. So before we jump into um, the breakout groups, I did want to just create a new space um, for our FNS partners. If you want to comment on any of this, um, and please jump in at any point, but if there's anything you'd like to highlight or lift up just from your vantage point at a, at a federal level. Um, I, I realize I'm on mute. Um, at this point, um, I don't have anything specific. I think Lisa covered it. Um, I will say I am excited to learn more about uh, the partnerships that may be happening here and potential partnerships. Uh, I'm relatively new to FNS, very familiar with um, the PLUS program and 50-50 and program, but I'm personally less familiar with um, community college partnerships. So I am, you know, I've been talking with SJI and learning, and I'm, I'm really interested to learn from you all in terms of um, you know, this initiative and uh, TA with National Skills Coalition. So I appreciate appreciate the opportunity to jump in and, and learn from you all actually at this point. Great, thank you for being here. Okay, anything else, um, Precious Lisa, anyone before we jump into um, anything? And Jayshana too, do you have any, do you want to add anything on 60 by 30 or any perspective kind of how this all links together from your leadership vantage point too? Um, no, I don't have anything to really add. It's just when we were talking about um, like application forms, it got my mind um, running about like our reconnect application and the information we receive from our students. Like, is this something that we could potentially add so we'll know whether reconnect um, applicants um, are receiving SNAP and can help fill that for our DHHS and workforce development partners and also the community colleges, but um, no other thoughts. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, that's what would be an awesome place. And that's a really, actually, I think that's probably, I would imagine a very high percentage of reconnect students potentially could be eligible or and may not know they could benefit also from SNAP benefits, right? So that's a really great um, students that you'll have that there's the services available, the, the coaching and connections there that, that someone they trust can also help get them connected. So it's a really fantastic idea. So next we wanna do a little bit of work around um, just getting you all the chance to talk in some breakout groups. Um, and so if you go to, um, we are going to break you out by region. Um, and Mark, did you have any questions? Oh, Precious, go ahead, sorry. No, you're fine. Um, I just wanted to talk about the timeline a little bit. So as we get into breakout rooms. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah. yeah, no, you're totally fine. Um, when we When you guys get into your breakout rooms, it could be helpful to start thinking about what does this look like in practice after today when you're thinking about, okay, what students do I identify? When should I start this process of identifying students for SNAP ENT? Um, the timeline that we're looking at is for community colleges to uh, be positioned and ready um, and have capacity for, for becoming a PLUS provider, submitting an application to their Michigan Works Agency in June of this year. If you are approved as being a PLUS provider in October, you would be able to begin um, offering uh, SNAP ENT services to your students. So with that time frame in mind, um, you could look at your short-term credential programs as a potential place to start identifying eligible students um, and identifying what partnerships need to be in place for SNAP ENT to get off on the strongest foot, right? So um, do you need to have partnerships in financial aid and what does that look like and how can you start building some of those partnerships now would be things to start thinking about as you're in your breakout rooms and um, in your breakout rooms and building relationships with your Michigan Works Agency. 
Thank you for that very important piece there. So I think when in thinking of that, this the goal of the series is to do some of the planning and work that we're then ready for that um, for the timeline here. And certainly, I guess I also want to reiterate like you the great thing about the timeline with this is you don't need to have everything figured out um by june so in in oregon we would submit our proposal in may and the new colleges that would come on board um you know would submit their proposal but then there's there were still a lot of questions at play about what this actually meant and how to build the systems and so there was time to set that up and start small. So also want to reassure that um, that this is a really great amount of time to get kind of if you think of it for the proposal, you need to have the framework and the goals kind of kind of mapped out for your college and what that can look like. And then the great thing is you'll have time with the partnership and support here to, to map that out over time and figure out by the time you start implementing, kind of have more specifics. And it's very much a, a program where you learn as you go. So just really want to also reiterate that. Um, so with that, Mark, I wanted to see, do you have any questions about great, great folks for breakout groups or? No, I've got everyone um, in groups. Uh, of course, the second you say we're going to go into breakout groups, some people drop off. So we're trying to reconfigure, um, hopefully not many. But just so you have this, if for some reason I put you in the wrong group, I just want to walk through briefly the group. So group one should be, uh, and I know we don't have any folks, I don't believe, from Grand Rapids, but Grand Rapids, Muskegon, and West Michigan Works. Group two is Jackson College and Michigan Works Southeast. Three is Macomb Community College and Macomb St. Clair. And four is Mott and GST. And then we're sort of peppering other um, state and national folks into each of these groups. And you have about 15 minutes or so. And if you go back to the agenda, there are links for each of those four groups. Um, so there's a Google document with a guiding questions. And we would just ask that someone in the group ideally take some notes so we have it captured um, and work through the questions. I think it's just GRCC that, um, and possibly Muskegon that don't have reps here, but Precious, I put you in that group thinking you could speak some to um, already you have with, with some of those examples. So um, if that works for everyone, I'm just gonna send you off into groups now, unless there's anything else, Kate, Precious. So I yeah, so I think what we want is it's really just continuing this conversation, right? So the questions are on there, but really want you talking about what holistic support look and case management looks like, kind of starting to document some of that, the outreach, and then um, where and how MWA might might um, help with case management. There's also an area for others. So if you start talking about something else that seems more important in terms of thinking about eligibility, capture that there. We want this to be valuable for you. All right, I'm going to open the rooms then. Here we go. And if for some reason you do end up in the wrong room, just come back uh, to the main uh, room and we'll we'll place you properly. Thanks, everyone. Mark, will you pause the recording, please? Yeah. Thank you. Welcome back. I think everyone's got another 30 seconds or so and it'll bring bring them back in i always love like the difference whether you just wait the like whether you wait or you're like exit 
<laughs> Welcome back, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. So I think that should be everyone. Okay, does one or two people want to share out from your groups any high level takeaways or things that you talked about? Or things you're excited about? I guess that's a good way of putting it too for partnership. I can start. Um, Mary with GST and uh, Mott Community College. Um, Gail, uh, who's on the call with uh, with me, uh, she and I have worked together for 10 years on, on partnerships between GST and Mott. And uh, <clears throat> we've kind of identified next steps. She's uh, identified some um, programs, both on the credit side and on the non-credit side that um, are serving students with uh, resources that, that match into FAE and T, uh, which is what we call it here, SNAP Plus to, to all your fed, federal people. Um, and um, we kind of think the next step uh, will be to follow the money, which I know is the topic next week, uh, next session, to see which uh, where the funding streams are that are eligible for reimbursement. There's lots of of opportunities of places to start at Mott. Uh, and we wanna start with, start small, um, but we don't really have the information about the funding to be able to identify uh, specifically where it would be best to start. Uh, Gail, have, what have I missed? That's, that's what I have on my notes. That's great. And yes, we will go into great detail um, next session about the funding. And we'll, I'll offer some resource mapping tools I've used um, for the colleges and having spent a lot of time trying to identify a funding stream and then working with other states and colleges have, um, I think, hopefully some streamlined tips to help with that. Cause I, that to me is the, the most complicated things that prevents folks from like tipping over and starting. So we will go into that next time. Um, anyone else, other, um, maybe one other group, any takeaways or next steps you're excited about? We just want to avoid having our CFO have a heart attack. Yes. And that, that I think generally CFOs don't believe this program works as it does. So there's also that piece, like we'll provide some framing around how successfully, gotten people on board um, and gone from the skeptical or thinking that it's money laundering to like really excited about the program. So we'll, we'll go into that next time. Yes. Any, anything else? No, thank you. Just clarity on the funding is going to be great. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, we we're not going to um, we will look at your notes and kind of compile and share them out. Um, we do want to give Lisa just a couple minutes of, of the next steps. Um, and I'm going to share my screen here um, to talk about some of the marketing tools here. Okay, great. Um, so we were talked about how we're going to market FANT plus to your students. And I just wanted to show that in 21, we had a promotional toolkit that was provided to the Michigan Works Agencies. And uh, our communications just gave, uh, came up with mock language that you could put on a website. Um, you can do impress releases. And so this information is available. It can be shared um, with the community colleges because it's designed for vendors and for Michigan Works agencies. There's also a flyer, Kate, if you're able to bring up the flyer. And this is really why I wanted to talk to you about it is the, the messaging. So when we brought up, brought up the toolkit, we were, um, it, the focal point was job seekers, right? So it's designed for a job seeker look versus a student. 
So our communications at WD is happy to switch it around and you know change out the word job seeker to student, but I really think that it may need more than just a word change. It may need a new look and feel. It's nothing we have to decide right now. It's just something that if, as the colleges are looking at this, if they could provide us with some guidance on um, what should a um, flyer look like? What should the, should the language be tweaked for, for that population? Um, the, the graphics be different? So, um, We've got this information to put into um, the Google Drive or to add to um, um, the material that comes out. And I just ask that the community colleges take a look at it and you know, give us your spin on what you think would resonate best with your students. Thank you, Lisa. And it's not pulling up. So I will send that out for everyone okay. along with the toolkit, um, along with the recording and notes. And then also the tools around um, some of the examples for outreach tools as well. So you'll be able to look at the outreach flyer that's there, and then we'll share um, the folder that has some other examples that other states or colleges have used. Um, and what I will say is when I started developing this in Oregon, I was really grateful. I had technical assistance um, through National Skills Coalition, actually, and SJI, and received a ton of tools from other states. And we just adapted and borrowed heavily. So want to encourage you to do the same, because that's what we did is we just took what, what seemed like we could tailor. So I will um, share that all and just feel free to copy whatever is helpful for all of you. Um, so that follow-up will be happening. Um, and then we will, like we said, go over funding next week. Um, we will send the, um, the questions for consideration in advance. Um, and then I want to look to the Michigan colleagues, but it may be a good one to bring um, your thoughts around this in your any college fiscal folks um, into the next meeting. So we will send that in advance, but that we've done site, but Mark and I have done some site visits and it made a huge difference having a financial aid director there. It's made huge differences having the CFOs there. Um, we can also connect um, college CFOs or financial aid directors with other colleagues that we have in comparable roles in other states who can talk up the program because sometimes there's, there's nothing any of us can say that will really fully um, assuage their concerns. And so that's been another strategy that we're helpful to happy to help support as well, because that's made a big difference too. So um, anything else from um, Michigan team around next steps or what you'd like to say? Um, no, just wanted to piggyback off of what you shared, Kate, about making sure you invite um, someone from fiscal to participate in the next session. Um, consider identifying non-federal financial sources that can be used for SNAP ENT. And then if you received an email from the ACCT team about scheduling a meeting, that's for technical assistance to iron through any questions you might have or what um, SNAP ENT looks like for uh, at your campus, how you can um, have this program be successful, um, given the dynamics at your institution, that would be a great time to ask some of those questions. And the only thing that I would add, Kate, is there is a chat from Macomb about the fact that Macomb does not run FANT at the MWA. And I think that's something that we can take offline. Um, thank you, Liz, for bringing that up. And we'll discuss how that can work, um, even if FANT is not at the MWA when the college is ready to go. OK, great. Thank you. And thank you, um, Liz, and your colleagues from FNS for joining us. And yeah, thank you. For this conversation. So, um, I hope you all have a wonderful day. We'll follow up with the follow-up information and thanks again for engagement here. Hey, is... Real quick before we yeah. wrap, I just want folks, I saw there was a glitch with the Macomb, uh, Macomb St. Clair Google Doc. So I created a new one and put it in the chat box. So I just want to make sure folks see that before they drop off. Awesome. And thanks Thank for capturing you. those notes. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Mark, will you stop the recording, please? Yep. Thank you.